The Secret of the Cosmopolitan Order by Christoph Martin Wieland Translated into English Introduction It will be about 14 years since the historian of the Abderites, on the occasion of an unexpected meeting of Hippocrates and Democrats, gave the first news of an invisible society that has existed for several millennia under the name of the Cosmopolitans and, according to his pretense, has great advantages over all other secret societies and an important and lasting influence in the things of this world. Should be, as any of the latter could basically attribute themselves. The little that the said historian had simply accidentally and in passing of this hitherto unknown secret order had omitted aroused a general attention, the causes of which we do not want to penetrate here. Enough, the more puzzled the matter seemed to most readers, the more eager they became to learn more about this secret. Of course, this curiosity did not have to increase slightly, because soon afterwards a famous man of the same decade in the urgent exhortations, which he quickly issued in succession to all the estates and classes of the nation. In order to carry out an institute infinitely important to the whole world to shoot together the small sum of 30,000 thalers, also turned to the cosmopolitans by name and with very special emphasis and trust, and thus the presence of these secret society, which had previously been doubted by some infidels, seemed to be out of all contradiction. In a short time, what the cosmopolitans had foreseen took place. Since their invisibility necessarily follows from the nature of the matter. Moreover, none of them can be a member of any other secret society, because from the moment he decided to take such a step, he ceased to be a cosmopolitan, and so, notwithstanding all the research and quiet knocking, the real members of this order remained hidden from all those who were not their equals, thus certain people, who were pregnant around this time with very far-looking designs, believed that they were doing a great thing to speed them up and to gain an even easier entrance. For some if they remembered a name, to which no one seemed to lay claim for several years, as if they seized a quasi-abandoned cause and, as often as it was conducive to their intentions, adorned themselves with the title of cosmopolitan or cosmopolitan citizen in order to awaken the opinion of themselves, as if they were really and exclusively in possession of the secret of which the author of the Abderite story had spoken in such an enigmatic tone. Whether they went to work here merely as his worldly speculators, or whether they perhaps believed to be honest in everything and, even deceived by the greatest of all magicians, may have really imagined that they were something they were not, we leave it at that. The latter could be all the more likely to be believed, since, by seeking to develop the concept of a citizen of the world, they could very easily fall for the supposed discovery that the enlightenment of the world, were not the only, but at least the most noble means, was whereby the cosmopolitans brought about the great influence attributed to them in sublunar things. Since the success, despite the brilliant prospects that seemed to promise the people of the cosmopolitans nothing less than the empire orb, did not correspond to their sanguine hopes better than those, without being their enemies or just lifting a finger against them, had foreseen. So it would be without any benefit to explain this process more clearly to us. But we think we have to add this, that one would find oneself mightily deceived if one wanted to flatter oneself, with any other slogan, for example, with enlightenment, which in any case is too synonymous with the unfortunate enlightenment to promise oneself a much better fate, to ever be happier. For the true cosmopolitans cannot and will no longer admit that secret societies, which in all their inner constitution and in the way they want to render services to the human race, are so completely the opposite of them, either presume their name or, under whatever other name it may be, awaken the opinion of themselves as if the cosmopolitans had any end and means with them and would ever be able to make common cause with them through the accession of individuals from their means or through a general union. The shortest and, in my opinion, the noblest means of achieving this end and putting an end to the juggling of all present and future pseudo-cosmopolitans, unless the world wanted to be deceived with seeing eyes at worst, is Indisputably, the decision I have taken, with the inevitable permission and on behalf of the whole order, that which has been the secret of the same so far, without all restraint to make so sincerely and clearly known that even the most simple-minded human child in the future will find it impossible to ever confuse real and fake cosmopolitans with each other. The time has finally come when nothing good causes the light to shy away from, at least it came for our fatherland. There is, thanks be to heaven. No Narons and Domitians among U.S. from whom good people would have to hide. Although in many areas the rights of reason are still diminished and challenged by old pre-centuries, so there is no truth. Which should not show up somewhere in Germania with revealed faces. 
In the happiest age of the Greeks, from which all the Enlightenment originated, the free spirit of investigation in the middle of Athens has never been allowed to appear more unrestricted than in our day. And even any abuse of reason in speculative things has, how cheap, no other punishment than to shy away from the breeding rubrics of criticism. And isn't the extraordinary toleration that was given to secret connections that could not be tolerated in any well-policed state, is not this toleration itself the most striking proof of how completely unnecessary it is to want to achieve any laudable end through hidden ways and mysterious means? The cosmopolitans can only win by proclaiming their secret in the eyes of all understanding and good people. It is not the slightest thing neither in their constitution, nor in their purpose, nor in their means, that should be hidden behind allegorical veils and in hieroglyphic darkness. They are allowed to show the world who they are and what they are up to. All of your secret orders, if you want to convince us of the legality of your constitutions, of the integrity of your intentions, of the innocence of your means, go and do the same. 1. Above all, in order to avoid the shadow of a misunderstanding, we have to explain to ourselves in what sense the cosmopolitans make up a kind of secret society. In fact, they have in common with all other human societies that they work under one law for an end through similar and harmonious means. On the other hand, they differ from all others by the greatness and perfection of their purpose, by the integrity of their principles and attitudes, by the always expedient goodness and pure harmony of their works and aspirations. But they can be called a secret society, inasmuch as that which makes them cosmopolitans has always remained hidden from the eyes of the great bunch and is such that even after the present complete discovery of their secret, some, although through no fault of our own, will understand little more of it than before. One can already see from this single characteristic how essentially they are different from all others. Both public and secret societies. Association. Orders and fraternizations. Other secret orders are secret only because they want to be. It depends only on them, so their alleged secret ceases to be a mystery. And the whole world knows as much or little of it as it does, in short, to be one of them, one only needs to be received by them and taught in their mysteries. With the cosmopolitans, it is just the opposite. One does not become a cosmopolitan through reception and teaching, but you are in their society because you are a cosmopolitan. One is born to do so and the additional teaching contributes no more than food and movement to the growth and formation of a tiaric body, without being able to make it something different than nature itself has given it the substantial form and inner disposition. 2. Not only are the cosmopolitans not bound by an oath to observe an unbreakable secret against all who do not belong to their order, but they even claim that no private company can be entitled to take such an oath without the express permission of the state in which it lives, and they declare such secret sworn associations inadmissible, however innocent their original intent and constitution would be. It is obvious, they say, that an arbitrary sworn association, not authorized by the supreme force with complete knowledge of the matter, is a kind of conspiracy and produces a state within a state that can become dangerous and nocturnal to the latter in many ways especially when it is only in the arbitrariness of the conspirators to extend the number of their members to as many thousands and hundreds of thousands as they like. Nothing but the most complete certainty that the common being could not be saved from its complete destruction by any other means can ever justify such a secret confederation. For in no state is anyone properly barred from doing as much good as he can and wants to do, insofar as he remains only within the limits prescribed by the constitution and public order and tranquility. And, also said, this restriction would be so narrow in some states or at certain times that some well-meaning men could not do everything he feels a profession to do, so he should and must calm down in the thought that he is not connected as a human being to anything that he could not do without violating his civic duties. The assurance given by such a conspiratorial secret society that neither its constitution nor its works are nocturnal to the state, to religion, nor to customs, also that it is completely sincere, cannot make its confederation more innocent or more lawful for who is the guarantor for us that they will not one day become what they are not now? In addition, the concepts and weakness of individual human beings are far too different and unreliable from such composed and extremely complicated objects to be allowed to depend on whether those who run such a society are always correct or incorrectly weak and not perhaps religion and state by the very means, which could make them feel useful to them, undermine their opinion. Least of all, say the cosmopolitans, such societies conspired to be secret can justify themselves with the example of the ancient Egyptian, Eleusinian and other mysteries of this kind.
with which they seek to give themselves in similarity that cannot hide from any expert the essential difference between them. For those mysteries were ordered by the legislators themselves, constituted a part of the political religious constitution and were directly under the supervision of the state. As soon as the secret orders can boast of equal merits, no one will dispute their legality. So the first thing that distinguishes cosmopolitans from all secret orders in society is that they have neither a secret to hide, nor do they make one out of their principles and beliefs. The whole world is allowed to know how they think, what they are doing, and what paths they are taking. They smile at the affectation of bringing symbolic books and hieroglyphics from the childhood of the world to mask truths that everyone has already learned in school. What kind of wisdom? They say, can one expect from men who dress in undressed dolls, play blind cows and hide needles with the most solemn expression of the world? Or what kind of male businesses can these be, which one wants to withdraw from the attention of the intelligent by a semblance of relapse into the first childhood? 3. The cosmopolitans carry the name of the citizens of the world in the most actual and eminent meaning. For they regard all the peoples of the earth as just as many branches of a single family, and the universe as one state, in which they are citizens with countless other rational beings, in order to promote the perfection of the whole under general natural laws, each being busy in its own particular way for its own prosperity. They are equidistant from the two extremes of either giving man the first role in space or looking at his presence for an insignificant game of chance, a dream without purpose, meaning in context. Without presuming themselves to the impossible determination of the actual rank he occupies in the infinite city of God, without wanting to explore, which is just as impossible, what he was before he was placed in his former sphere of activity. Or what he will be when he ceases to be what he is, they are convinced by the advantage of reason, which makes man above all his roommates of the sun dust in the universe. Who is a world for us, so high, that man, regardless of his apparent smallness, is not merely an organized and animated material a blind instrument of foreign forces, but as a thinking and willing being himself an active force and, intertwined in this twofold way in the general plan of the whole, plays a much greater role, when he himself is able to overlook. For, or from this conviction springs a double principle for the cosmopolitans, which guides them throughout their lives. The first is, all the provisions and consequences of their presence that do not depend on their will, all apparent evil that they either cannot foresee or, if they saw it, could not avoid as a natural consequence of necessary collisions or dissonances, in short, everything that they, insofar as they are mere instruments of nature, involuntarily work or suffer, to be seen for something for which they are responsible to themselves or others just as little as to the effects of the laws of shock, gravity or any other law of nature, the effect of which is necessary and unstoppable. The other is, to focus all their attention as much as possible on what depends on their own mind and will, what they can do well or badly, better or worse, in all things of this kind, even in small things. To set oneself the goal of the greatest possible perfection and to proceed with the greater severity against oneself. The more leniency one could expect from the other. Nature, they say, has given each person the special disposition to what he is to be, and the context of things places him in circumstances that are more or less favorable to the development of the same, but she entrusted her training and perfection to him. It is up to him to improve what nature has left deficient or even lacked, and to elevate his facilities to artistry it is in his own interest, and he cannot have a more concerned business than the desire to come as close as possible to perfection in his kind, which in a certain sense has no limits. Since the plan of his life does not depend on him alone, since he should be ready for any use that the supreme ruler of the world wants to make of him, so his first and highest duty is to acquire the greatest possible suitability. A high degree of this suitability, insofar as it depends on practice, diligence, effort and perseverance, and thus on our own will, is what the cosmopolitans call virtue, and the ideal of the same, the yardstick by which they determine the value of individuals. From what has been said so far, the difference between world dwellers and citizens of the world arises. The former is given not only to all men, but even to the whole leader of the thieves descending under him, but a citizen of the world, in the narrower and noble meaning of this word, can only mean the one whom his prevailing principles and attitudes, through their pure harmony with nature, make fit to participate in his instructed circle for the good of the great city of God. Only the good citizen prefers to deserve this name. 5. The cosmopolitans have and recognize as such no other superior than necessity and the law of nature or, which basically says the same thing, as the unfathomable eternal primordial being, which is the beginning and the end of all things. 
It would be a very insignificant play on words if one wanted to say of them that they had unknown superiors. How hidden and inaccessible to us even the supreme ruler of the universe is, we know enough of his government to have unlimited trust in it, and enough of his laws, I. E. Of what in the intellectual and moral world produces order, harmony and progressive perfection, for our will and our effectiveness, insofar as it depends on our will. To make the same uniform. Apart from this subordination, there is such a perfect equality among all cosmopolitans as can only ever exist with their individual diversity. They receive their authority and instruction from the hands of nature. There are no other degrees among them than the levels of their suitability and inner moral goodness. And since they have no particular secret plan, have no secret connection to the processing of far-looking intentions, do not awaken an extinct order from the dead, do not seek to bring about church associations and have nothing less in mind than to reform the world according to its sense and mediate an artificially invented machinery that requires incessant supervision and relent, to want to rule according to Jesuit style and art, in short. Since they do not present a state within a state and do not know of any common religious interest, which could come into collision with the interest of bourgeois or ecclesiastical society or would probably even be in a constant deliberate opposition with the same, so it is clear that they do not need any particular constitution, no worthy superior, no secret office, no sack master and no communal cash. 6. This, regardless of all, is true in a literal mind what was said by them in another place 14 years ago, namely, that Despite all the distance between space and time, they are in the closest connection with each other, recognize each other at the first meeting without their custom or agreed signs and are immediately the best and most familiar friends. The whole mystery lies in a certain natural kinship and sympathy that manifests itself throughout the universe between very similar beings, and in the spiritual bond with which truth, goodness and integrity of the heart chain together noble people. I don't know of any stronger one, at least the cosmopolitans don't need another to see a meanness that surpasses all other human societies in order and harmony. 7. From what has been said so far, it is self-evident that the cosmopolitans can never get into the strange embarrassment about what the purpose of their order is, in which one has probably seen other respectable and world-famous societies. They will never have to call general or special synods to find the secret of their mystery and to answer the questions, who are we? What do we want? Where do we come from? And where are we aiming? At least to be able to give oneself a satisfactory answer. There are no different opinions about their end and their means, no parties that are not only different in imaginary ways, but even the antipodes of each other and, although they seem to make up a whole externally, are inwardly in such a bad relationship with each other that the purpose of the one is to destroy the work of the others. The cosmopolitans, so many of them scattered throughout the world, are all together, in the sharpest meaning of this saying. One heart and one soul, for they have only one common purpose in which they all, without noise, without the rattling roar of a cumbersome wheelwork. In secret, although seen by everyone, each according to the mass of his powers and means and according to the point of view, what he is set on to continue quietly. This purpose is in itself the simplest, most innocent and most benevolent to think of, for it is neither more nor less than what is contained in the following formula, to reduce the sum of the evils that oppress humanity, as much as is possible for them, without causing harm themselves and to multiply the sum of good in the world to the best of their ability. They are aware that in every moment of their lives they have the pure and firm will to use themselves for this purpose, which, according to their conviction, is the purpose of their presence and is in the purest harmony with the great and ultimate purpose of the whole universe. They can, as human beings like others, miss in particular the best remedy or the right measure or the most fancy time, although they encounter this infinitely less often than others, but their purpose is always the only true one and since one of their basic laws is not to do anything good by violent or deceitful or ambiguous, let alone shameful means. It is, as I said, merely a consequence of the limits of our nature when they fail to achieve their noble purpose in special, often very complicated cases. This case must necessarily be all the more inspiring for them, since they are not deceived and led astray in their weakness by no precursors and delusional concepts, in action neither by secondary intentions nor passions so they have the advantage over others. That not only their way of thinking is always healthy, and their purpose is always louder, but also, as far as the loose of humanity allows, they can always act according to their principles and therefore always be sure to really do the good they want to do.
8. Under which state constitution a cosmopolitan may live, it is now that he has been determined here only by necessity or by his own choice, so he always lives as a good and quiet citizen. The principles and attitudes that make him a citizen of the world are also the basis of his benevolence against the particular civic society of which he is a member, but they are also what limits the effects of this benevolence. What was called love of the fatherland in the ancient Greek republics and among the proud citizens of the city that believed to be founded to rule the world is a passion incompatible with the cosmopolitan basic concepts, attitudes and duties. No Roman could be a cosmopolitan, no cosmopolitan could be a Roman. The only Pomponius Atticus perhaps made an exception. But he was also in the that, after his epithet, more Athenian than Roman. And what could he do more wisely and better in his circumstances during the storm that overturned aristocratic democracy in Rome than to limit himself to the fulfillment of his cosmopolitan duties? The cosmopolitan obeys all the laws of the state in which he lives, whose wisdom, justice and non-profit status is evident, as a citizen of the world and submits to the rest out of necessity. He probably means it with his nation, but he means it with all others and is incapable of wanting to base the prosperity, glory and greatness of his homeland on the deliberate overriding and oppression of other states. The cosmopolitans, therefore, never engage in special connections that would be incompatible with the exercise of these attitudes. They elude any responsibility for a state administration, whereby the opposite maxims would be prescribed to them as basic rules. Therefore, if there could be something even rarer in any state of not inconsiderable size than a minister who would be a cosmopolitan, it would be if that minister had remained in his place for ten years in a row. 9. The cosmopolitan is, in accordance with his most essential religious duties, always a quiet citizen, even if he cannot be satisfied with the present state of the common being. But, although this latter, for a lack of objective motives for which he is not to blame, must sometimes be the case, although, with the best will of the world, he cannot always sing and applaud all that is good, cannot always sing and applaud the measures and actions of the heads of the state, sees their weaknesses, vices, skews, missteps, inconsistencies, etc. Very well and very seriously disapproves of them, in short, whether he immediately knows the infirmities of the state constitution, legislation, police, economics and the entire state administration on a large and small scale, and perhaps also the means to remedy these infirmities. And wants nothing more eagerly than to see them remedied, so one can certainly count on the fact that he will never, neither for selfish nor patriotic motives, nor under any other pretext, disturb the public peace and seek any improvement by means contrary to the basic law and violent means. Never has a cosmopolitan had a conspiracy, an upheaval, a stir of a civil war, a violent revolution, a royal murder intentionally, nor has he ever approved, let alone recommended and publicly justified, these are similar means of improving the world. A Timoleon who set his fatherland free through fratricide, Brutus and Cassius, who murdered Caesars at a time when his longest possible life would have been a blessing for the world, Milton, who publicly denounced the beheading of Charles I, Algernon Sidney, who considered anything permissible against a tyrant, were republican enthusiasts, not cosmopolitans. There is no lack of examples that these latter have also cited and worked in a certain sense against intolerable abuses of the highest violence against political and religious despotism, against demonstrably unjust and unreasonable laws, against an oppressive state administration of hopeless ministers and the like, but only as long as it could be done by lawful means. In such cases, resistance is even one of their religious duties, only they are not allowed any weapons other than the weapons of reason. May they use them with so much wit, eloquence, acumen and strength, as they always have in their power for the good of the good cause, and in this kind of war, defense and attack, show as much intellect, wisdom, steadfastness, frankness and perseverance as is always possible, if they have done everything, they have done nothing but their cosmopolitan duty enough. But as soon as they see that the burning heads, who are at the head of the better-minded and the oppressed, for example, take such paths that must violently shake the state by their natural consequences, as soon as it is designed to buy the targeted improvements then they may be worth with the domestic happiness, prosperity, and lives of thousands and hundreds of thousands, then they withdraw, now work rather to extinguish the fire lit in the state than to blow and maintain the flame even. More, and when the voice of reason, which commands moderation in all things, is no longer heard. They prefer to stand out from all action before they want to run the risk of doing harm against their intention. And do not become more active until the time has come to rebuild according to a better plan, what is under the wild movements of the fanatical party spirit and the raging struggle of arbitrary power, 
who had to preserve themselves, with the offended humanity, which seeks to make itself free and to take revenge, had to go to ruins. 10. This behavior has always been interpreted by the cosmopolitans for fear of man, smallness, lack of zeal for the good cause and selfish egoism, and in the that, people who are not cosmopolitans, out of cowardice and lack of noble feelings, can seem to behave just like those. But, according to an old and very true remark, it is not always the same when two do the same thing, and just as, to talk to pirates, a fool can say what a wise man spoke wisely, so a man of a small soul can do in a bad way what a noble man does in his own way. The reason for the conduct of the cosmopolitans in the aforementioned cases is a principle that belongs to the first basic laws of their order, namely, that in the moral order of things, as in the physical, all education, all growth, all progress towards perfection must be organized and brought about by natural, gentle, and from moment to moment imperceptible movement, nourishment and development. All Sudden Disturbances of the Balance of Forces All the violent means to bring about in a shorter time by leaps, which after the proper course of nature could only grow in a much longer time, all the effects that are so violent that one cannot calculate the measure of the force that is necessary and sufficient to produce the thing, but always runs the risk of far more, as it is necessary to do, in short, all the tumultuous effects of the passions according to the directions of one-sided ideas and exaggerated demands, if they should. Also produce something good in the end, destroy so much good at the same time and, by wanting to control great Ubel, even so great Ubel that only one god is capable of deciding whether the good or evil that is worked in this way has the preponderance. Therefore, according to the basic concepts of the cosmopolitans, the gain that humanity receives through violent and violent means of putting itself in a better state is more apparent than real. According to her conviction, she always loses on the one hand what she gains on the other, and in a longer time, with infinitely fewer sacrifices, she would have received the good, or rather a far greater one, if reason alone had guided the forces that were applied to it. Yes, even this multiplicity of time they do not see as a loss, since the nature of things is allowed a greater perfection and permanence of the good, which is obtained in this natural way, which is the infallible fruit of it. Moreover, the apparent neutrality observed by the cosmopolitans in most cases, where the state disintegrates into parties, is nothing less than indifference to the good cause, but it is precisely their enlightened and well-ordered zeal for the good cause that is the reason why they do not declare themselves, with the exception of two cases alone, for any party. Usually, the good cause lies more or less in the middle between the parties whose neither is entirely right nor completely wrong, and the cosmopolitans whose primal salvation is not distorted by any passions, misled by any secondary intentions, find. For all their apparent calmness and indefatigability, a thousand opportunities and means to prevent much evil and to do much good that would escape them if they declared themselves publicly and exclusively for a party. I know of, pre-touched masses, only two cases where the cosmopolitans unite with one party against another. The first is, if it is morally certain that their public accession would really make the difference to the good cause, the other, if a party apparently suffering injustice were in danger of being completely suppressed without its assistance, or if one party treated the other with a cruelty that outrageous humanity. For example, in the Dutch riots under Philip II and his diabolical tool, the Duke of Alba, no cosmopolitan could take sides other than against these inhumans. Thus, as an example of the first case. If the future representatives of the French nation came up with the good idea of imposing appropriate limits on the arbitrary power of the king and his ministers and appropriate to the nature of their state, no cosmopolitan would be able to stand for a moment to support this party from all his strengths as long as it remained within the limits described above. 11. The cosmopolitans claim that there is only one form of government against which there is nothing wrong. And this, they say, is the form of government of reason. It would consist of a reasonable people being governed by reasonable superiors according to reasonable laws. It hardly needs to be remembered that the word reasonable is taken here in its proper meaning, not in that where it denotes the mere ability to become reasonable, but in that where it denotes the real activity of reason and the full exercise of its dominion over the tiaric part of human nature. That this form of government still belongs to the things that everyone desires at certain moments but which have never been there before, will hardly be denied by any reasonable person. But that it is not only possible, but that all bourgeois society, thanks to an inner necessity, strives for it and, however slowly progress may be, comes ever closer to it over time, is a favorite law of the cosmopolitans, whose truth is based on no weaker ground than on the great, 
in their opinion irrefutable moral axiom, that, thanks to an infallible event of nature, the human sex may ever draw closer and closer to the ideal of human perfection and the bliss that springs from it. Without ever reaching it. In their opinion, all forms of government known so far are just as many natural steps on which human society rises to the most perfect, the government of reason. Each of them initially formed itself in a purely natural way, was almost always the work of accidental causes, momentary needs, personal advantages and merits on the part of the rulers. Voluntary affection or gratitude on the part of the people. Each was soon less appropriate to the particular circumstances of the latter, the lower or higher level of its culture, the stroke of heaven under which it lived, the location and physical condition of the land, the food and way of life, the national temperaments, etc. In those oldest times, which are rightly called the childhood of the world, reason usually worked only as an instinct. People, still children of experience, sensual, lively, reckless, restless and impatient like children, always cared only for the present moment and foresaw little more than children, of the future, i.e. of the natural, but slow consequences of the present. Few of the peoples of the elderly appreciated the value of freedom, even fewer knew how to combine freedom with civil order and the arts of war, which is, in a sense, the natural state of raw people, with the arts of peace. The Greeks knew it, and through them, whose merits to humanity can never be recognized enough, Europe gradually became what it is and will probably always remain, the true fatherland of the arts and sciences, the world's salvation, in which the culture rose to the highest, and that, although the smallest, by virtue of the infinite supremacy, which its inhabitants through the much greater and always progressive formation of all human natural abilities over the rest peoples of the earth preserved. Forever the ruler has become. For known reasons, however, the effect was just so well known that, with the fastest progress of culture in individual arts and sciences, which depend on the inventiveness, the hustle and bustle, the persistent diligence and the competition that the co-application produces, the highest art of all arts. The royal art of putting peoples in a happy state through legislation and state administration and to maintain them in it, relatively, it has been left behind the furthest. The larger and more beautiful part of Europe still lies under a print that suffocates the noblest forces of humanity, the heavy pressure of the remnants of the barbaric constitution, the ignorance and the errors of a raw and dark millennium. In some of our most powerful empires, the rights of the throne are not yet set against each other, not weighed against each other and determined in accordance with the first basic law of all civil society. There are still states where the source of the laws is not general reason, but the often very stupid mind and the wavering will of a single person or the few who know how to seize his authority. In most countries, what is called the administration of justice is still desecrated by barbaric or poorly related laws that are ill-suited to time and circumstances. In many countries, nothing is more uncertain than the security of the property, honor, freedom and life of citizens. And all this in Europe. In a century where art and science, taste, enlightenment and refinement have climbed steps in a relatively short time, from the height of which one can look down on the previous centuries with a kind of vertigo. But even in these important pieces, which fortunately for the peoples are so essential, if our trust does not deceive us, the present state of Europe seems to be approaching a benevolent revolution, a revolution that is not characterized by wild indignation and civil wars, but by quiet, unshakably steadfast perseverance in a dutiful resistance, not by the pernicious struggle of passions with passions, of violence with violence, but by the gentle, convincing and ultimately irresistible superiority of reason. In short, a revolution which, without flooding Europe with human blood and setting it on fire and flames, will be the mere benevolent work of teaching people about their true interests, about their rights and duties, about the purpose of their existence and the only means by which the same can be achieved safely and infallibly. What is already happening at this end in the course of the present century is well known, what is in the process of becoming will perhaps be decided before it is lost and will be of the most important consequences and you can rest assured that the cosmopolitans won't give up idle spectators for all of this. 12. It illuminates from what has just been said that the cosmopolitans regard the forms of government that still exist now, so to speak, as mere scaffolds for the performance of that eternally existing temple of general bliss, which in a certain sense all the preceding centuries have been working on. But despotism is, in its terms, a barbaric form of government which, in order to exist for a long time, presupposes circumstances and conditions that are no longer conceivable in the brighter nations of Europe. 
Above all, he has always been unknown to this world style, even in the times that preceded culture and enlightenment. For thousands of years, freedom was the element of both its raw, polished and educated inhabitants. All the founders of today's European empires were leaders of free people, and where, with the exception of a single Nordic one, is there a public act? Whereby in one of the rest the people would have formally and solemnly renounced their right to freedom? On the contrary, can it not be made clear from history that everything that the throne has won in some states over the undeniable rights of the nation has either been deceitfully deceived or violently usurped and enforced? But, if one could also prove that our ancestors would ever have been stupid enough to consent to their oppression and to let it come down to the blatant arbitrariness of one or more people, as he or she wanted to switch over their persons and their property, what could such a thing, by way of law, harm the claims of its descendants? Against the eternal laws of reason, against the essential rights of humanity, there is no renunciation, no statute of limitations, no omission of the opportunity to assert or address them. The first thing that people, under what government constitution they live, and what only an avowed tyrant could dispute to them, is to be human beings. And they cannot be human if they are slaves. The application of this great basic truth which even the most shameless flatterer and rejected servant of the rulers must not be subject to, is rich and fruitful in just as undeniable conclusions which give the cosmopolitans hope that by the end of the 19th century Europe will be one great one to what they call the form of government of reason. Then it is dermal. The benevolent light that spreads ever further over this salvation of the world, penetrates ever deeper and also illuminates the alleged holy darkness of false statecraft into its most secret caves and corners, becomes the people's both as the rulers better and more thorough, those about the scope of their rights and the limits of their duties, which, on the other hand, vice versa, to teach about the limits of their rights so often exceeded and the so often forgotten size of their duties. They will learn to see that only a fool can be expected to give gold for yellow leaves and to be afraid of flashes of bare-lobed dust, that only sheep are subordinate to a lord, who lets them graze only to shear them and, as soon as it occurs to him or is convenient, slaughtered and that it is only up to them to recognize spider threads, which they have considered in a strange delusion for unbreakable ropes, for spider threads. On the other hand, the almighty Noth will finally open the eyes of the rulers who need it and awaken them from the dreamlike deception in which most of them have always misunderstood their own true interest. From the innermost conviction that it is infinitely better for the holders of the supreme state power to rule over free, hard-to-do and happy people than over tiaric, moothless, slowly starving slaves, better over people rich, flourishing in everywhere beautified countries by the effects of diligence, bustle, the arts, and the rich, than over poor huts and feral wastelands, they become willing to the hated power, to wreak havoc against their intention, in order to be able to do nothing but good all the more unrestrictedly, and by committing themselves to a kind of violence that cannot be attributed to any god, let alone a human being, they will lose nothing out of inner conviction, but they will believe that they will gain a great deal. It would probably be too sanguine to hope for such a benevolent revolution from a magnanimous decision to sacrifice its own destiny for the common good, but, since it is so obviously their own highest interest, it can be expected with the best reason that the time when such an evident truth will also penetrate to them is no longer as distant as many small believers imagine. Noth doesn't just teach prayer, it also teaches to think, and when one considers how great and how spread out is often the benefit of a single rational thought that a regent has at the right time, so the friends of humanity cannot help but rejoice that some seem to have been so eager to sit down in this salutary need quite soon. 13. Since the most rational constitution and government of peoples, which, according to the system of cosmopolitans, approaches the whole connection of human things with slow but the firmer steps, can be accelerated by nothing more than by the greatest possible culture of reason, the greatest possible spread of all basic truths, the greatest possible publicity of all that facts, observations, discoveries, investigations, proposals for improvements or warnings of harm, the announcement of which may be useful to individual societies and states or to the human race, thus the cosmopolitans regard the freedom of the press, without which all this could not be achieved, as the true palladium of humanity at that time, on the preservation of which all hope of a better future depends, the loss of which, on the other hand, would entail a long and terrible consequence of unforeseeable ruins. One does not judge this matter one-sidedly or above. We know what can be joked about in a funny mood or sighed about it in a dark one. 
and just as well known to us are the more or less apparent reasons why one wants to cut open and paint an alleged necessity to set arbitrary limits to the freedom of pressing. But they coincide with themselves, considering that freedom itself is lost as soon as it is set different and narrower limits than the nature of things allows. Now, however, it has long been irrefutably proven that the freedom of press, without gradually curtailing it until nothing remains of it, must not be limited to anything other than those imposed on every writer, bookseller and printer by the common civil and embarrassing law. In fact, all the writings whose publication in every political state, however great the personal freedom in the same may be, is a crime and must be due to the nature of the matter, that is, writings which contain such direct insults to individual named or clearly designated persons, which are forbidden and frowned upon in the civil laws. Writings which seek to arouse almost indignation and indignation against the lawful authorities, writings, which are almost directed against the lawful basic constitution of the state, writings that work almost to overthrow all religion, morality and bourgeois order, all such writings are just as certainly punishable in every state as high ver wrath, theft, assassination, etc. But the word direct or downright is nothing less than idle here. It is so essential that the entire criminality of an accused writing is entirely based on him. For, as soon as any appointed book censor or the bourgeois judge were allowed to judge a scripture by inferences that depended on his way of imagination, his particular opinion or his prejudices, the degree of his intellect or ignorance, his expertise or ignorance, the crookedness or correctness of his inner eye, the integrity or depravity of his feelings and tastes, what book would be safe from condemnation? And do we not know from experience that in countries where there is such an arbitrary censorship, it is precisely the most excellent books that are the first to be placed in the register of banned ones? So it is that in order to have one more office, one wants to appoint a book connoisseur, or that the investigation of writings that are claimed to be criminal is left to the ordinary judge. It is always undeniable that he can only prohibit books whose author has thereby committed a crime about which the bourgeois judge is entitled to knowledge. On the question of whether the content of the book is old or new, interesting or insignificant, useful or harmful, whether the author is argumentative for better or worse, no other censor has to recognize than the public and the time that collects and makes known the decisive voices, much less can a book be suppressed by force on any such pretext, without interfering with the most essential rights of the scholarly republic, which, just like the Christian one, is completely independent of the state, as long as it does nothing against its principles. The sciences, literature and the art of printing, the noblest and most useful of all inventions made since the invention of alphabetical writing, do not belong to this or that state, but to the human sex. Well done to the people who appreciate their value, welcome them, care for them, cheer them up, protect them and let them live and weave unhindered in the freedom that is their element. Above all other peoples, the German nation has excellent reason to be a protector of press freedom. They in whose lap first the inventors of typography and soon afterwards the courageous men who, only through the free use they made of it, were able to liberate half of European from the tyranny of the Roman court, to assert the rights of reason against ancient prehistoric elements and the independent spirit of investigation, who gradually spread such a benevolent light over all objects of human knowledge as to wake up from a slumber of more than a thousand years. How evil it would be for us to take back our own well-beings, to stop the progress of the sciences in the middle of their most lively course and to the enlightenment, to which we already have so much good to thank, and from which we and our descendants can promise ourselves so much better, to set unnatural limits. Since it is just as limitless to the nature of the human spirit as perfection, what humanity can and should achieve with its help. Moreover, the cosmopolitans will never make a secret of the fact that freedom of press cannot have a zealous advocate but their order, since in the that it is the only means by which he can be active in a larger circle commensurate with his powers and thus fulfill one of his most essential duties. Truly, if those who know no higher interest than truth should not be allowed to speak freely, the stones should finally begin to scream.